Hello, I'm Dr. Joseph Nunn, Professor Emeritus, UCLA Department of Social Welfare. I'm happy to be here today to interview a good friend of mine and actually an important historical figure, Dr. Terrence Roberts. So I'm looking forward to talking to Terry, is how I'll refer to him from now on, and sort of catching up on him with him on some of the things that have been going on. Terry, good to see you. Yeah, it's good to be here. How have you been? <laughs> I'm doing good, man. Great. It's, after all these years, it's yeah, nice it's been a to, while. Uh, to get together. And I'm honored to have an opportunity to interview you for the, uh, the oral history for the California Social Work Archives. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing some of your responses to the questions that I'm going to ask. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to give folks a good view at your life, which has been very exciting up until this point. Uh, I don't expect it to become unexciting from now on. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I'd like to start, Terry, by asking you a little bit about what it was like growing up in Arkansas uh, in the 50s, and um, especially related to race relations. Well, we have to go back to the 40s, actually, okay. since uh, I came on the scene in 1941. And I didn't know it at the time, but I quickly found out that the whole country was operating under the aegis of this Supreme Court decision, Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896. Now that, that decision didn't start what was going on, it was simply a codification of stuff that had been happening, but what it meant was that I was relegated to a position in society that was considered second rate, or maybe even third rate. The Supreme Court decision said that we, the people, would be separate but equal based on where we were in the racial group hierarchy. Now, it made no sense. I couldn't figure it out. In fact, it was very disturbing to me as a young kid once I found out because all of my questions went unanswered. Many of the people I tried to talk to wouldn't talk to me. They said, you don't want to talk about those things. You don't want to cause trouble, which is very, very interesting. So that was the start I had in life. And I had to figure it out. At first, you know, one of the things I thought was maybe I'd been born in a place where all the people were crazy, but maybe outside Little Rock there were people who were sane. Well, that proved erroneous once I got to move around. Then I concluded, okay, the whole country's nuts, so let's go with it. And yeah, what kind of messages did the adults give you about how to handle yourself uh, in situations when you encountered white people? Well, uh, different kinds of messages. Uh, there were some people, and you might say that they were arrayed along a continuum at one extreme, people were so frightened, they wanted me to simply obey the rules of segregation. At the other extreme were people who were chafing under that bit and wanted me to, you know, begin to push with them. But I think in the middle, you had people who were willing to compromise. So for instance, from that middle, I got this one message most of my young life, and that was, boy, get your education. That was a mantra I heard all the time. So I had to figure out somewhere I fit along that continuum myself. And I figured out after a time that I was leaning toward that group who needed to push against the realities around us. The push you did later in your life. Yeah, yeah, it came to it. Uh, uh, <coughs> I want to talk a little bit about that uh, following uh, Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954. I believe that Thurgood Marshall and the NASW uh, championed the class action suit where the Supreme Court uh, ruled they can no longer segregate students. Uh. Yeah, now that was an interesting twist because this is the same court that in 1896 had said it was constitutional to discriminate. Now in 1954, suddenly it's no longer constitutional to do this. Now you gotta wonder about this constitution. <laughs> Who is interpreting and what does it truly mean? So that was a, a very eye-opening for me. Although, I must say, when that decision was made in 1954, my optimism went up a bit because I thought, ah, the law is now on my side. 
I can model law-abiding behavior, and that's what I intended to do. And uh, that kind of led to the next step. Around 1959, as a student in high school, I was watching television, and something was happening in Arkansas. And I saw these black youngsters integrating Little Rock High School. Well, that would have been 1957. Is that 57? That's okay. 57. And that was the year. That was the year. See what had happened in the wake of this 54 decision. The Little Rock School Board decided to obey the law. I think it was a combination of the people who were on the board at that time mm -hmm. and their ideas that were a little different from the people around them. And they put out this word that they were going to desegregate one high school. Didn't win them any friends, by the way. In fact, they came under heavy fire. Their initial plan was to have integrated at the kindergarten level, kindergarten through third grade. But the people were so antagonistically opposed to that notion, they had to give it up. And they came back with plan B, which was grades 10, 11, and 12. Now, I think the rationale on the part of the folk who were opposed was this. These kids, by the time they get to 10th grade or 11th grade or 12th grade, have been so immersed in this ideology of racism, they will rise up in opposition. That's what they were banking on. They were right, in fact. But so we, uh, turns out, eventually there were nine of us who agreed that we would do this. There were more than nine who had volunteered, but because of the fear of our being killed and our blood flowing in the streets of Little Rock, a lot of parents said, absolutely not. You're not killing my kid. But the parents of the nine of us were of a different mind. They said, okay, uh, we have here a small window of opportunity. This window is open now. It probably won't be open very long, so we should take advantage of it. So with that, it's, that compelled us forward. I remember watching, uh, as I said, on television, and uh, what really struck me was sort of the historical quality to the people who were opposed to the integration of the high school. <coughs> One woman in particular, I remember her just screaming, they're in our schools, they're in our schools, like all of a sudden the world was coming to an end. Well, for her it was, yeah, because, see, <laughs> it looked like her, and she was typical. They had grown up with this notion that the racial hierarchy had meaning. They considered themselves to be at the apex of this hierarchy and that people who were below them should simply remain in their space, stay where you're supposed to be. In fact, once I got into school, one of my teachers, my English teacher, confronted me one day. And she said this, she said, why don't you go back to your own school? Why would you want to come to our school? See, again, that notion of ownership, of space. My thought, <laughs> I thought she was absolutely insane because here she is, a so-called teacher, telling me that she has ownership in these public institutions, i.e. her school, and implying that I, too, have some ownership in terms of my going back to your own school, right? And I thought, wow, I don't know if I can have a conversation with somebody who is this far out. So I didn't say anything. I just smiled and walked off. And I've since come to understand that that's my usual response to idiocy. I just smile and walk off. I mean, why would you bother talking to somebody like that? The gulf was too great. Was there something about you uh, when they selected the students to uh, integrate, integrate Little Rock High? Uh, your parents said it was okay. Was there something about you? No, we all volunteered. Okay. Uh, in fact, there were probably 150 of us who had volunteered. But then a lot of our parents, once they found out about it, said no. So those numbers dwindled. And then at some point, the school board, under really heavy pressure, decided they were going to have a screening process. Their goal, as it turned out, was to screen out all of us. We would have been the Little Rock Zero. But the NAACP found out about it, intervened, and got a court order for them to stop. By that time, I think there were 17. The night before school was to start, there were 10 of us. We were the Little Rock 10 for a very brief moment. But the 10th child, her dad worked for a man who didn't like any of this stuff, so he called him up and said, look, if you send your daughter to school tomorrow, don't bother coming back to work. So he quickly pulled her out. Now, the upshot of that is uh, he lost his job anyway, which if he had bothered to call me, I could have told him in no uncertain terms, your, your job's history anyway. I mean, you've had the temerity to think you could send her. That's enough to send this employer over the edge. 
by that time, see, I knew a lot about who I was dealing with. Yeah, it sounds like you were very wise at an early age. <clears throat> well, maybe, was, maybe you had to be. Yeah, I had to, to be, absolutely. In order to survive, you're right. Because one of the things you found out very quickly as a black kid in Little Rock and during that time, if you weren't aware of all the dynamics around you, you could wind up dead very quickly. It's interesting. I had similar experiences. I grew up in Los Angeles, and yet I traveled to the South, to Louisiana, to visit grandparents, aunts and uncles. Right. And it struck me as being a little absurd to have four restrooms <laughs> in the airport or the train station. And that just, four? Yeah. I because mean, I, I remember having only three. Tell me more about that. <laughs> Men, women, colored. No distinction of gender for that group. See, stuff was really bad. Yeah, yeah. No question. Yeah. Um, when I did meet you, and we'll talk more about that later on, uh, one of the things I noticed that uh, on your coffee table when I first met you, we have both had families, and you invited my family to right, your right. house, and you <coughs> sit in there, and there's a big rock on your coffee table. Tell me about that rock. You know, I, I don't remember what that rock was. <laughs> I do have a fascination with rocks. Uh, in fact, I have a few painted rocks outside a tree in my house now. I'm not quite sure what they signify. I was down with my grandsons just last week babysitting for them, and I noticed that Austin, a young kid, had three rocks on his desk, and I started admiring them. He said, Papa, you gave me those rocks. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't remembered. What I recall so. is you told me that somebody threw that rock at you. Well, that's quite true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> As you were going I saved the rocks. Going into the high school. Speaking of those, I had a young kid from a high school in New York wrote a poem about the Little Rock Nine. And in it, one of the lines in the poems were, those were not little rocks they were throwing. I thought, wow, that's very cool. I like that. Yeah, I got to see one of those rocks. <laughs> um, now, as you got into the high school, um, they called out the National Guard, correct? Well, the National Guard it essentially kept us out of the school. By the time we were able to get in, they had been removed. They had been actually federalized by Eisenhower, who was president at that time and ordered off the premises. So the 101st Airborne Division came in, and those were the guys who made it possible for us to get to school. And they were on the scene for probably three or four weeks, after which they were replaced by these newly federalized National Guardsmen. Interesting transition. The same National Guardsmen. Same ones was. who kept us out yeah. are now charged with the responsibility of keeping us safe while we're there. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of people have questioned me about whether they really did their job, I say, you know, what I learned during that year was that if you're in the military, you follow orders. So if you're a foot soldier, no matter your point of view, what you think, if you want to stay as a soldier, you have to follow orders, which is very interesting. And so I never really felt that they didn't protect us. Now, if you talk to some of the others of the nine, you may find a different opinion but as for me, no problem. You want to stop? Okay. Um, so, what kind of job did they do when they... When they uh... Well, I think they, they did a pretty good job, really, because I think without them, we would have been killed. So, when you put it that way, they may have been slow in responding, as some of the others of the nine say. For me, I never hung around to see how fast or slow they would respond because I would, my plan was to run. See, we had a vow of nonviolence. So rather than stand there and get hit all the time, I would just run. Didn't always work. But whether they responded fast or slow didn't matter because I was zooming away. Yeah, I remember you telling me about a time when you really, and there probably were a number of them, but this one was especially poignant where you thought you were gonna die. Yeah, a couple of times during that year for sure. I mean, I was never certain on any given day that my name wouldn't wind up on the coroner's list. But there were, there were times, there was one this time, especially when it was in, in PE. We had been spread out, the nine of us. We weren't in the same classrooms, none of us. We were assigned homerooms based on our grade and our, alpha, our name, they're all by alphabets. So there were five of us who were juniors. I was a junior. Three were 10th grade and one was senior. So we were scattered all over the school. You might think of us that year, not so much as the Little Rock Nine, but the Little Rock One nine times. So I'm assigned to this PE class. I'm the only black kid in there. You got 50 or 60 guys, right? Now, 
this situation could have been scripted. <laughs> have this one guy walk in to all of these hostile others, they're going to find some way to harass me. So they would do things, and then I'd get hit with a ball or tripped up or something, and then they'd complain. Uh, they'd say, well, he should have been watching. So the coach one day said, okay, I've had enough of this. So he called all of us together, and he decided, in his wisdom, that the only way we could resolve this thing was if anybody had a problem with me, they could challenge me to the mat. Now, this was not something that we'd agreed to. Well, at any rate, these guys line up. All of them, they line up. So, at that point, I figured, okay, this is your last day on earth. Because I didn't see any way I was going to escape from that without getting killed. And the coach didn't seem bright enough to see it coming. So I thought, okay, one thing I'll do, if they're going to kill me, I'll kill the first guy. So that was my plan. So this kid came at me on the mat, and I got him down in a headlock and discovered that he had a chain around his neck, a pair of dog tags. And I just seized that chain as an instrument to restrict his air supply. And I'm all in, committed. So I know this guy has to die first, so I'm not letting go. He starts turning blue and red and gasping for breath. Then the coach runs over and says, okay, okay, break it up, break it up. And sent us all outside which was not a Phi Beta Kappa move on his part because you, you realize that after this stuff that just went down on the mat, something else is going to happen. So that was the prelude to the second time that I'm thinking I'm going to be killed because once we get outside, I'm accosted by this guy with a baseball bat. And he's coming at me, big guy, much bigger than the other little kid I had on the mat. And I thought to myself, okay, this is really it. So I didn't know what to do. I couldn't take him on physically. So I just decided to maintain eye contact. And he got right up in my face. And then he said, nigger, if you weren't so small. And he dropped the bat. Now this kid had some spark of humanity that he paid attention to. Otherwise, he would have bashed my head in. So days were like that all the time. Were there any uh, teachers or any of the staff in the high school that were helpful? Yeah, there were. There were a few. The problem was, they were under heavy pressure from most of the others who said, if you do anything that would be considered friendly toward the black kids, we will kill you. So they were operating under this sort of injunction, if you will. Now, some of them defied that, but not that many. Not that many. I, I found it interesting that years later, they made a um, television show about one of the teachers and it focused on her experience at, at, at Little Rock uh, when you came in as a student. Right. And hardly at all on the nine students that came in. Oh, right, right. That was the uh, vice principal, Elizabeth Huckabee. Okay. I remember that movie because they invited me to be a consultant and I declined. I didn't want to have anything to do with that fairy tale. <laughs> anything else that stands out? Uh, Again, I realize we could spend most of the interview talking well, about, about Little Rock. Well, I think the, the thing that stands out, and, and a lot of people ask the question, they say, how long did it take for people to settle down and accept all of you and get on with school and life? And I said, well, that's very optimistic. <laughs> uh, in as much as we're still working on it uh, in this year, 2016. See, the issues haven't gone away. And, and that's the one thing, if any, nothing else, on this tape, I want it clear that the issues that we faced in 1957, we still face in the year 2016. And I say that for those people who insist that we have to look at the monitors of progress that they want to look at. And I say, look, all of those monitors of progress exist on that thin veil of civility that we've all agreed to lay down. But underneath that thin veil of civility, there's a volcano raging. And it erupts from time to time. So you don't think the election of uh, President Barack Obama was the end of racism? In the <laughs> US? <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> uh, during that time, um, did you meet Martin Luther King? I did. Tell me about how <clears> it <throat> happened. How did it come about? In what See, Martin Luther King like? was very new in this ministry that he was beginning. Very young man. He came to Little Rock. He came to the graduation when Ernie Green, who was a senior in our group of nine, graduated. He was in the audience. Now, the rest of us were not allowed to attend the ceremony because it was considered too dangerous. They didn't think it was at night, it was outside in the stadium, and our safety would be in question. So they just decreed, no, only Ernie and his family, so we can keep an eye on them. And Dr. King, 
passed himself off as an uncle. And he hadn't yet reached that stage of notoriety where people actually recognized him, so he pulled it off. Well, afterwards, he and the Green family came back to the home of Daisy Bates, who was the president of the Arkansas State Chapter of the NAACP, and we had a briefing, a post-mortem, if you will, from the graduation. So Ernie was able to tell us how he had felt about it and what had happened, and Dr. King was there to give his thoughts. So I met him in that context. What was your impression of him at the time? Well, I thought he was a man who was really dedicated to the notion of nonviolence because he talked to us a lot about that. We had chosen nonviolence as a way of being at Central, and I didn't know exactly what that meant in terms of his career to follow, but I thought, you know, here's a man of very strong convictions, if nothing else. Yeah, I remember, remember, remember early on uh, having some difficulty with the notion of nonviolence. I had to grow up and get older before I really learned to appreciate what a strong position that was and right. the power there is in being able to resist oppression in that way. Yeah, it's a hard one, you know, for people who live in areas where violence is very present. And how do you practice nonviolence? You know, and in fact, a lot of people in the Deep South thought Dr. King was crazy. And when I'll never forget this one man, his his comment was that nonviolent stuff will get you killed. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, you didn't finish at Little Rock uh, High School. No, no, the governor, Orville Faubus. Yeah, say a little bit about uh, the governor. The governor, interesting guy. He put on this mantle of white supremacy, but he didn't grow up with that. In fact, he came up in a household with a grandfather who wound up on the House Un-American Activities list at some point. So he was not one of those people who would toe the line and spout the accepted narrative. So Fabus at least had an understanding of that. But his political ambition took over, and he figured out that in order to be governor of Arkansas, he needed to be as racist as he could be. So he wrapped himself in that cloak, and it became a part of him. So you couldn't tell that, he, that there'd been any other thing in his life except that. So he called out the National Guard to keep us out in the first place. He was very unhappy with Eisenhower for sending in the troops. In fact, he was on television a lot talking about Arkansas or Little Rock was an occupied territory and that we were being forced against our will to desegregate these schools. So that was his position. So at the end of that first school year, he had been wrestling with this notion of what can I do as governor. Finally got this brilliant idea. I'll keep the black kids out by closing the schools. So he closed all the high schools in Little Rock for the 58-59 school year. Now, that was not the brightest decision that a governor could make when you realize that by closing the school to keep the black kids out, you lock all kids out. He hadn't thought it through that far. <laughs> but <laughs> that's not really that unusual in this country because there's no requirement to hold public office that you have a measurable IQ. I mean, you can, you can be as dumb as dirt and hold office. And so that was true with Faubus. As a consequence of the school's closure, I decided to take up offers I had from relatives who lived in Los Angeles to move here. So I moved out to L.A. to start my senior year at L.A. High School in 1959. Fortunately, I had that option. And I say that because a number of my peer groups, age group peers rather, in Little Rock didn't have that option. So for a lot of the kids, it was a lost year. More than that, it meant for some of them they dropped out of the whole educational process. Some took jobs, others went into the military, some of the girls got pregnant, people opted for drugs and that sort of thing. So all of these other things that intervened, you know. One of the horror stories, you might say. Uh, what was it like moving to Los Angeles? Uh, what was your first impression of? Uh... Well, I, I knew a little bit about LA because I had relatives here and they visited. We, didn't, we really never visited before, so it was my first <coughs> time here. But I knew enough to know that I was simply moving from one part of the South to another part of the South. You see, already by that time, my mental map had been recalibrated. So for me, the South was anything South of Canada. So I was not confused. When I was in L.A., I understood the dynamic. Other people here, black people particularly, were able to help me further refine my understanding by telling me what all the signs meant. 
you know, in terms of the, the nuanced signs, if you will. For instance, I was told, be careful if you ever have to travel to Fallbrook, California during that time. And at that time, Fallbrook was the headquarters for the Aryan Brotherhood. There were other people who told me something quite different. They said, look, when you go out to Beverly Hills, you'll be fine. You'll be treated with respect because salespeople there work on commission and they figure that the only way you'd come out there is they, you would have to have money uh, to feel comfortable. So they want to make money. So don't worry about things. So I knew that I would get stopped by the police on occasion because I would fit the description. So I would just build that into my activity schedule. If I had to be someplace at 2 o'clock, I'd leave a half hour early so the stop wouldn't interfere with my being on time. Yeah, I remember uh, in junior high school, we all picked aliases uh, so that when we were stopped. Uh, You'd be known as, as right. <laughs> so we, we knew the stops, stops were, were, were coming. Uh, so you went to LA High, uh, integrated school. Yes. Yes, probably one of the most completely desegregated schools in the whole city at that time. Mm -hmm. Interesting dynamic, because that neighborhood had not yet reached the tipping point. And so there were people from a full range of ethnic backgrounds and racial groups and cultures living cheek by jowl, and the school reflected that population. That has since changed. But my year there was wonderful. In fact, I had been locked out of extracurricular activities at Central. But at LA High, I could join anything. So I did, I joined everything. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, after graduating from LA High, uh, you went on to uh, your, do your undergraduate work. Was it uh, Cal I went to Cal State LA. Yeah. I went to Cal State LA and got a degree in sociology. And I took a job in child welfare and here in LA County. It was during that time that I began to figure out what I might want to do with the rest of my life. And I decided that what I thought I wanted to do was to be active in communities and help people to develop a keener sense of self, more high level self-awareness, but more than that, to involve themselves as groups in the community to push for access, for services from the public sector, for better housing, for jobs, that sort of thing. That was my thinking. And that eventually led me into social work. Which is where I met you. Right. As the uh, right. entering class of uh, 1968 in the UCLA School of Social Welfare. You know, I had, I had met uh, John Oliver, another of our classmates, before then. And I had actually applied to only one school, and that was the USC. And I was all set to go in the USC School of Social Work. And John called me up, and he said, man, we need you here at UCLA. We are a small contingent of black students, and we need you. So I switched. So I switched in midstream, came out to UCLA. And, and it was good, because there were just a, about 10 of us, I believe, in our yes, class, yes. about 10 of us. Yes. Um, what I remember about going uh, uh, to my interview for admissions is that uh, the director of admissions asked me what I thought of black separatism. I was thrown a little bit initially, thinking that, I wonder if he asked all the students that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't ask me that, but he asked me a strange question. And you know, for the life of me, I can't remember that guy's name, I but remember his name. <laughs> he asked me if I'd had speech therapy. It sounded like a, a non sequitur. Then it dawned on me that since I was from the Little Rock in the South, he probably felt I should have a very thick Southern accent. That must have thrown him off. Oh. confused him because he'd already put me in the pigeonhole you didn't say and there that. I was struggling to get out. <laughs> <laughs> those, those were some exciting years. Uh, in fact, I remember getting up in the morning I couldn't wait to get, get to school and uh, so much was going on. And what kind of things stand out for you during those two years in the MSW program? Well, a lot of things stand out. You know, it's very clear that the school under duress, it seemed, was willing to consider adding more students of color. And one thing I do remember is the alliance that we made with the Latino students in terms of pushing the school to admit a lot more students of color. And we were successful. You remember, they admitted 75 students per year. We got them to agree to enroll 25 black students, 25 Latino students, and 25 other. Uh, ten Asians and then other. Right, and then other, right. Yeah, yeah that was interesting. Uh, years later, I heard from uh, people I encountered in the community, they'd say, uh, yeah, I couldn't get into uh, 
UCLA at the time because they were taking unqualified minorities. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh yeah. But it, but it was exciting, and you know, forming the Black Caucus and you know, Doc, Dr. John Oliver and the leadership to, to make that happen. Um, it was quite a time. I think what was what stands out for me is some of the optimism at that point, and we thought we could bring about change. And you, yeah, you I think I think uh, I I've always been optimistic. In fact, I'm still optimistic that we can bring about change. I'm just a little more realistic <laughs> <laughs> about how that's going to happen. But yeah, that uh, that I think that fueled us. I mean, we got the energy. We were able to stay up those late nights doing our caucusing and planning. Yeah, I I like that. Yeah, I remember a lot of work went into planning how to approach that. Right. And, uh, as I recall, we, we shut the school down. Uh, right. Uh, picketing, and uh, that was that was quite an experience for me. Do you remember that? actually standing oh, out there? Oh, I, I remember that. I remember that. I remember. Yeah, and it, it was it was a hard thing to convince all the students that this is something we should do, because it was not something that was written out in the manuals. Well, I do remember one student saying, "Hold my sign. I got to go to class." <laughs> right. Until we all grab you. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I think other, uh, Dr. Douglas Glasgow was right. there, I think probably one of the first uh, African-American professors, and uh, he was there to help us along, and uh, one of the things we were pushing for as a tenured African-American professor, as along, along with more cross-cultural content in, in the curriculum. Right. And, uh, things that actually, they did make some progress on, but we were sort of at the forefront of really pushing for that. Oh yeah, they, there were a lot of things that needed to be done. For instance, uh, I, later, after I'd been out of, of school for a while, I talked to Harry Catano, one of our professors there. And Harry would make jokes about it, but it was very serious stuff. He said he had spent the maximum amount of time at each level of the tenure ladder. So, you know, <laughs> typically people don't stay the full term at any given rung, they move up quickly. But in Harry's case, he had to spend the maximum amount of time at each rung on the ladder before he finally made it to a full professorship. Yeah, I found that interesting at the time because UCLA, you know, with, with all of its uh, egalitarian values and, you know, social work values. Right. You know, about inclusion and, uh, you know, people, again, egalitarian values uh, ran into some difficulty. Oh, some yeah, the, yeah. The See, things they were facing. <coughs> right. I think it's important for people to realize that simply because we were a school of social work didn't mean that somehow we had been anointed and that we were her now saintly in our approach to things. <clears throat> no, the issues that were there then, by the way, are still there now in terms of how we see the reality of us as a universe of people. The majority of people, the overwhelming majority of people in, in this country still think in terms of racial hierarchy. No question about it. You think about this. You look at any social measure, you'll find that hierarchy being played out. And it's only because it exists in the minds of people that that can happen. Without that sort of compelling thought process, things would sort of fall along, um, you know, even, uh, what do you call that, distribution, the curve distribution. Yeah, bell -shaped curve. Right, it'd be a bell-shaped curve. But it hasn't done that. And that's not by chance, not at all by chance. I think you had greater insight than I did based on your experience, early experience. Uh, I didn't realize as I got older how entrenched some of the racial animosity was. Uh, I looked at the overt barriers, the you know segregated uh, counters, mm -hmm. the segregated restrooms, mm -hmm. uh, sitting in the back of the bus, uh, sitting in the first car, the train, all those things as uh, once we got rid of that I thought we would make some progress and some of the doors did open into jobs we never had right before. right but um, you seem to be more aware of some of the, the depth of some of the resistance well I think it has it has its um, origins for me in studying the history of this country when you really look closely at who we have been as a people we started off with a mindset that said this will be a country for white men primarily. And that's what we did. We built this country and we made it possible for that class of folk to prosper. And they have. Now, the legacy is such that they don't want to give that up. They would prefer to maintain that. That's why Trump has such a following. He spouts that same rhetoric 
with little filter. And people are energized by that because they say, now at last we have a Savior who will speak the truth as it should be spoken. Yeah, interesting, using the same kind of uh, motivation that Father said. Yes. We're, we're, we're using that uh, back in the time when you were in high school in New Rock, and now we see it emerging all over again. But you know, when you think about it, it from 1619, which was a date that the very first shipload of Africans were brought to this country. Now, they weren't enslaved in that year, but a few years later, they were the first contingent of slaves. The institution of slavery then lasted for hundreds of years. In 1896, when Plessy decision was rendered, as I was saying before, it wasn't the start of that. We can go back to 1619 for the start, but it took until 1896 to sort of put it in writing, the separate but equal concept or doctrine. And then this really crazy thing happened in 1954, and I still don't understand all those dynamics of how and why that happened. I'm very glad it happened because it changed the law. Now, even though the law changed, nothing else changed with it. I'm aware of that. Right, you see, right. you the are social, part of the, actual beginning of the cultural, the yeah. ideological, the psychological, the emotional, all that stuff has remained intact. And that's where we need to do the work. And I would say, if we don't do that, then the future is not certain. Right, we certainly are aware of that now with the current presidential right. uh, election. Um, anything else you want to say about our time in grad school? Uh, wow, <laughs> there's a lot to say. <laughs> there is a lot to say. <laughs> yeah. I, I think um, what we saw in grad school was simply a mirror image of what was happening outside the school, if that makes any sense. You know, the dynamics we went through with our professors and our classrooms and our fellow students, all that stuff was just a, a mini America right there. The same stuff that we had to contend with outside, we were contending in it right there. I'll never forget uh, the dean once telling me in the wake of Rodney King's beating, he said, you know what, <laughs> uh, actually this was later, because I came back to the school as an administrator. Right. I'm confusing my dates, but it's still it's relevant. Anyway, the, the dean said to me, I think I'm beginning to understand that what you've been saying to me is the truth. <laughs> 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 well, but that hasn't changed. I mean, that, that could also be true when I was a student. See, I came back to UCLA later. Right, right. I want to get to okay. that, but that was an amazing statement right. <laughs> to, to, to have him say that. And uh, he's actually someone I have some respect for, mm -hmm. and yet still struggling to understand exactly what, what was taking place. Now, upon finishing grad school, um, I went back to the probation department. You had uh, sort of greater ideas about what you wanted to do, so you went on to work Well, in yeah, what happened when I was at the social work school in UCLA, there was this interest on the part of a lot of the students in psychotherapy. In fact, as students, we had to be in psychotherapy as part of the learning program. So I got excited about that whole concept, and I thought I should learn more about this, so I decided to take a PhD in psychology, which I did. Then I took my first job was at a um, college up in Northern California. Well, let me go back in time a little bit, because in order to, to get the degree, here's how that happened. I got a call from one of our professors who had been at UCLA. He had taken up a position as director of the undergraduate social work program in Southern Illinois at the University in Carbondale. He called me and he said, I want you to be on faculty. Well, when he posed the question, I thought, well, let's see what we can do here, and lights went on. I thought, I need to be a student. I need to have money if I'm going to go to school. If I have a job, I can do it. So I said, look, I'll take that job and be on your faculty if I can also be a student. Well, he thought it was okay, but we had to run it by the dean of students and the dean of academic affairs, and they all agreed, so we worked it out. And so I became an instructor in the School of Social Work at the undergraduate level while I was a student in the doctoral program in psych. It's worked out really cool. Now, a lot of my faculty colleagues were upset by that because they saw that as me getting undue privilege. And I thought, how weird <laughs> that I would be seen as the one getting undue privilege. 
in a world where a lot of people get privileged and I just had to be on the sidelines. Well, at any rate, it all worked out. What did, I, you, do your what did you do your dissertation on? Well, I decided to take a look at what was happening in schools of psychology because we had a, a process whereby if you were impaired as a student, mentally impaired, the resolution of that was to kick you out. They would call it counseling the student out. So I raised the question, look, if we claim to have tools in psychology that help people restore themselves to mental stability, why can't we use it with the students who are having trouble? So I decided to take a look at that to see if we could work it out. Turns out, what I found out was that that can work. However, it's not so much dependent on methodology, it's dependent on the people. You see, if you like people, you will do whatever it takes to make sure they get what they need. If you don't like them, you kick them out. It was that, that simple. I mean, I couldn't write it up that way. I had to make it sound very uh, acceptable using the jargon of psychology. But <laughs> the point was that if you really like a person, you will go the extra mile. You will do whatever it takes to make sure it happens. And that, for me, that was instructive. And I went way beyond the students in schools of psychology to apply to life in general because I could see it all around me. Those people who had champions here and there it was all a function of people liking you enough. Speaking of that, I recently read about some research where a school principal told these teachers in a middle school that they had tested these kids and some of them had tested brilliant. They were IQ was off the chart and he identified those ones who had done so, sent them into school. Truth is, none of the kids had ever been tested. They were just chosen at random. But those kids who had been designated with the high IQ, they performed much better. So what this principal concluded is the teacher, understanding that these kids were brilliant, treated them as if they were brilliant. The kids responded Spons as if they were brilliant. <laughs> they became brilliant. So it goes all the way back to the research I was doing there in Southern Illinois. Yeah, you were also sort of looking at the uh, implications of stigma. Uh, and once, once we have, you label somebody, uh, there's generalizations about that person. Exactly. And so once they're mentally ill, we generalize that determine that they can no longer... They're not one of us anymore. Yeah, not, not one of us. Not on our side. That's right. So after um, teaching in uh, upstate California, um, were you doing anything else before you went to Napa and worked at well, the Department of I went, I went directly up to the Napa Valley from uh, Illinois, from grad school. And actually I took my first job there was teaching in a small college, Pacific Union College, and I taught in what they call the Behavioral Sciences Department, which included social work. I did that for a couple of years. Then I took a job as Director of Mental Health at the St. Helena Hospital and Health Center. I had a dual job, actually. I was in charge of mental health and the Department of Social Work. So I was an administrator in social work and mental health in that hospital. I did that for 10 years. Then after that 10-year stint, uh, my wife, who had finished her Ph.D. in history, got a job here in Southern California. So we moved back to Southern California and chose to live in Pasadena because I took the job at UCLA as a dean of students, assistant dean, and Pasadena was equidistant between Claremont, where she was, and UCLA, where I had to go. And that's where we ran into each other again. Right. Uh, I came as a doctoral student and also as one of the field liaisons exactly. in the program. And uh, I remember it was a good time for, for us. It was probably the most African American men they've had there before or, or since, after. Or, or after. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of remember too when students would sort of get us confused. Right. All three of us were over six feet. And so, uh, <laughs> so I, we had to sort of laugh about it and uh, it became sort of an inside joke. <laughs> Yeah, that, that sort of stuff still happens. <laughs> you also taught cross-cultural awareness uh, at UCLA. Uh, tell me about your experience as the uh, assistant dean for student affairs and uh, also your teaching. You know, it was a very interesting time in my life because I was not really settled on what I needed to do or wanted to do, but I quickly saw that in this position I could be very actively involved in convincing students of color that they needed to be in school. So a large, a large part of my time and energy was devoted 
to rounding up students. And I, I met some very interesting resistance and really taught me about what living in this society could do to you. For instance, there was one young black male student that I thought had promise. I invited him out for an interview and I was a little late getting back to the office so he was already there and he was perspiring. And I said to him, you know, you didn't have to, to run to get here. Even if I were, had been on time, I could have waited for you. He said, no, 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 I've been on campus for an hour. He said, I'm just anxious and nervous because this is a white school. And I thought, wow. So in his mind, he'd already concluded that he didn't have a place there. And then another instance it was a young Latina, young woman who I knew had great promise because I'd seen some of the work she'd been doing. The issues were a little different in her case. She was married. Her husband got wind of this notion that she might be going to grad school. Next thing I knew, she was pregnant and she couldn't go. And I attributed it to him and his decision because he had been so antagonistic to the whole process. So he made, made sure that she didn't have that opportunity. And I thought, okay, so I need to really continue to do this work somehow. But during that time, uh, that's where I put most of my energy. Yeah, it was always a challenge to get students of color into the program. And one of the things that struck me when I returned, I think it was 1980, was that you know we had 10 African-American students in our class. And then uh, the next year, there were 25. That when I returned in 1980, there were four. Right. Yeah, I so remember that. In, in that 10 year <coughs> plan, that, you know, because you, again, the illusion of progress, we're really pushing this thing and things are happening. And I learned that if you don't maintain the pressure, see, and that's. Things just go right back <coughs> exactly. To and, and that's something that people in general are not aware of. The system, if I can be so bold, is flexible. It will bend and allow you to think there's progress. But then when you <laughs> take your gaze away, ooh, it's coming back. Yeah, it springs right back. This happens all the time. You know, here's an aside. When we moved to Pasadena, this was after that stint in Napa Valley, my wife and I decided to buy a home. We hired a real estate agent, young white woman, bubbly, bright, energetic, enthusiastic, showed us home after home after home. Meanwhile, we were coming acclimated to the city, and after a time, we realized that all of these homes we were seeing were all clustered in one area of the city. Now, we'd driven around, and we'd seen homes for sale in other parts of the city, and we were just kind of wondering why we hadn't seen any of those. So, we fired her. <clears throat> we hired another agent, same ilk, same result, that same cluster of homes. Now, by this time, lights came on. We figured it out. Aha! So there's this conspiracy. So you see, by law, we have to see any home that's available because of the housing laws, right? But these real estate agents hadn't read the law, or they weren't abiding by it, but they were operating on the basis that, okay, you need to be here. So we fired the second one, went out and found a home of our own, found a sign, called the agent, made the appointment, 10 o'clock Wednesday, we show up about 9.55. The office was in San Marino. Well, coming down the stairs as we walked in was this woman with a clipboard with a smile on her face until she saw us. And that smile faded. She got a frown. She clutched that notebook, turned around, and ran. So I said to my wife, that's our 10 o'clock. She said, are you sure? I said, oh yeah, let's follow her. So we followed her to her cubicle. Turns out, yes, she's the one. She very reluctantly did the paperwork so we could buy that house. She wasn't happy about it. Interesting stuff, right? So we move in. Our next door neighbor comes over and before she introduces herself, says to us, I want you to know, I voted for you in the neighborhood watch council meeting. Really? So we thanked her profusely <laughs> and then inquired, well, what was this vote about? She said, well, neighbors were not sure they wanted to support your being here. Turns out we got enough votes to squeak by. Uh, <laughs> interesting stuff. Interesting yeah, stuff. And that amazing. was in 1985. Amazing how pervasive. Well, actually, it was 1988 because we moved down in 85. Yeah. Pervasive those experiences were. I mean, they, they were common. And 
You know, it's both an uh, example of over discrimination as well as in institutional discrimination. That <coughs> even though the laws say a certain thing, operating below that is sort of this desire agreement or almost a tacit agreement. That See, that's, that's what I agreement. meant by the thin veneer of civility. Yeah. Everybody agrees that things are cool. You know, we have laws on the books, we have restrooms, you don't have to have special ones, et cetera, et cetera. But underneath that thin layer is this volcano. And, and that's where people are plugged into. So this real estate agent, as a prototype, gets her energy from the volcano. So she's saying, these people need to live here. <laughs> so the law says what it says, and that's fine. But in my job, I'm going to be sure. And it's like Wells Fargo saying, it's OK if we do predatory loans for this group of folk, because they're, that's who they are, you know? They're the sheep to be sheared. Right, and they're obviously a greater risk. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in teaching cross-cultural awareness uh, at UCLA, um, what was that like? Um, I taught the same class and had, had a number of experiences that, that stayed with me. Well, yeah, I mean, there were so many experiences because for a number of our students, especially the white students, this was very new. These were concepts and principles that they'd never looked at. I recall one young woman saying to me after class one day as she was crying, she said, you know, if what you say is true, my grandfather is racist. I says, well, yes on both counts. Uh, <laughs> yes, what I say is true, and yes, he's racist. But that doesn't mean you should stop loving him. Because her dilemma was, do I need to cut off all relationships with him? I said, no, you don't have to abandon him because he is imbued with these notions of racist ideology. He's not atypical. <laughs> he would be usual. So don't throw him under the bus. <laughs> but, you know, those were the kinds of things. And then in another class, I had one student, I'd ask each student to think about when was the first time you ever encountered a person of color in a, you know, social or situation where you'd be talking and so forth. They thought about it. So one, one young girl said, well, don't think it was until I got to college when I had black students, fellow students. A few minutes later in, in, the, in the class, she raised her hand and you could see her turning red and very sheepishly she said, you know what? I forgot. I grew up with a black nanny. Now she had forgotten that yeah. to that you know, degree. She only knew the nanny's first name. She'd never ever learned the woman's last name. But that woman was in her life from infancy, from her birth, till the time she went away to college. And she'd somehow lost that memory. Yeah, and that, that to me was always one of the contradictions that they could have, people could have intimate relationships with folks, have them in your home, uh, have them raising your children, and then not want to sit down next to them on the bus. And, uh, yes. It always struck me as like, this, this just doesn't add up. You know, uh, that class, I think, is, is so needful. In fact, by the time I got over to Antioch, we had that course as a mandatory course for every student. Mm -hmm. I think it still is at UCLA, mm -hmm. uh, that all students are required to, uh, to take, take that class. It's kind of interesting, the Council on Social Work Education required cross-cultural content in every class. Ah. And yet, what tended to happen is when you had a cross-cultural class, you say, oh, that's okay, you'll get it over there. <laughs> in that class. You'll not get it here. Right. And when you went to UCLA, when you left UCLA, uh, you uh, went to Antioch. And tell me about, about your experience over there. Uh, that was a very interesting experience because they were looking for a department chair for their program in psychology. First thing I thought was odd about that they were going outside the department looking for a chairperson because ordinarily that chair sort of bubbles up generically from within. Somebody there, you know, is qualified to be the chairperson. They didn't seem to think so. They wanted an outsider. So a red flag popped up in my head. I thought, okay, so there's some issue, some problem here. I don't know what it is. But I went over and poked around, talked to people in the interviews and decided, okay, I could live here, but I thought, I need to find out what this problem is. First week on the job, I found out. There was a faculty member there who had been charging students for services that they'd already paid for in their tuition. 
And everybody knew this, but nobody was willing to say anything. So I called him in, let's say on a Monday. I called him in on Monday. And I said, this is what I found out. This has to stop. He agreed. He said, you're right, you're right. But on Tuesday, he had a different mindset. Now he is angry, he is storming mad, he's calling me all kinds of names. And in his fury, he says, I'm taking a sabbatical. Okay, I agree, because I thought it would be good for him to get out there and rethink the whole thing. Well, he, he did, he took a semester sabbatical, but at the end of it, rather than come back, he sent me a, a letter, well, not really a letter, he sent me an envelope with a cardboard piece in it with his keys taped to the cardboard. His way of saying, I'm not coming back. Very passive aggressive even then. But, so I resolved the problem. Next thing I did, I was the first black person there, by the way. Everybody else was white. So I said to the faculty, we're going to hire a consultant to help us work on our racial issues. And they said, what do you mean? We don't have any racial issues. We hired you. What do you think? I said, that's what worries me. <laughs> I said, you've hired me, and I don't think you know what you're getting into. So they reluctantly agreed, and we hired this consultant. A woman from Santa Barbara came in, spent some days with us. The faculty members were shocked at their own racism. I said, you see, I told you. <laughs> and then I got them to agree that after the consultant left, we would continue that process on a monthly basis. We would get together and continue to do the work we needed to do. And that led us really to being a, a better group. We were able to work, you know, with more honesty because I, I knew, see, I knew in advance what their backgrounds must have been like, even though they never said, because they'd been in an environment, even at Antioch University, which has this history of being so very liberal. It's the place where Coretta Scott King went to school, etc. But uh, when I was in Antioch, we had a faculty retreat. Oh, there were five campuses nationwide at the time. We all met up in Seattle. And for one of the opening exercises, they had us all line up according to the date we signed our first contract with Antioch. And would you guess, we had this ghetto at the, at, at the end of the line. <laughs> it was so stark and so compelling that that was a very sobering moment. I mean, people, we had been sort of boisterous, and, but now people were very quiet, almost mute, very subdued in their interchanges, because the realization was that even though we pride ourselves on being this very liberal university, look what we've done. And we've not hired any black people for years until here they are, all at the end of the line. Yeah, I think uh, that experience uh, at Antioch and, you know, my experience at UCLA is that, quote unquote, good people, Yes. Have a hard time coming to terms with, with the fact that, hey, I harbor some racism. Right. Uh, some sexism. Um, there was a time when I would tell my students, I think I got this from Mitch Maki, is that I'm racist, sexist, and homophobic. And they would look at me and they were like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> but how do you work on that stuff unless you recognize that you have it? Exactly right. How do you begin to, to address it? What struck me, Terry, is you, you, you seem in both situations going into Antioch as well as what was happening to you when you were younger, you had an immediate read on a situation where you felt something that just wasn't this. Oh, yeah. You were able to quickly yeah. ascertain that something's just not right here, and uh, I need to pay close, close attention. Uh, yeah, those, those are the dynamics that are always there. You know, I, I remember reading this story written by Albert Murray in a book called South to a Very Old Place. Albert Murray was a journalist among other things, but he said at one point, when he goes into a setting where there are other people, his antenna come out and he takes a reading in the room. And if the antenna reading tells him that it's safe, he'll stay. If not, he will bid a very early goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Survival. Survival. So I use that as sort of a metaphor for life. You know, I have these antenna when I go in and take a reading. Yeah, I know who's there. Sometimes I, I see the reading and it seems a bit dangerous, but it's okay. I'll, I'll you know, I'll stay. Just see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> um, good survival skills. Um, you finished at Antioch, and I think right now you're a consultant. You're doing a lot of consulting. Yeah, I've retired from anything organized. I have my own consulting firm, 
And by the way, speaking of that, uh, my wife and I just started a new enterprise. Last August, a year ago, we launched uh, a group called Roberts and Roberts LLC. And our website is talkingaboutrace.com because what we plan to do once my wife retires, which will be in a couple of years, we're really going to put that thing into action. And basically what we're going to do is to invite people to engage in conversations about race. Now we realize that the conversations themselves won't resolve any of the problems. But we recognize that most people don't have enough awareness about these things to even begin the conversation. Right. So we want to prepare them to get through the conversation, then to be able to put their heads together to think about what they can do to make needed changes. And I say in the website material that some of this stuff will be very visceral, but don't be afraid of it. Because once you allow yourself to jump into that pool and experience the visceral reactions that you have and the others have, eventually you're going to feel the need to crawl out of that viscera up to the cerebrum where we can have intelligent conversations. And we're willing to help you do that. That's my wife and I. So, Yeah, it's, it's challenging. Uh, I heard a speaker when I was up at a conference in Canada say that one of the difficulties with cross-cultural education or training is people deal with it like as an inoculation. In other words, I've had that already. Right. <laughs> Don't bring it up with me anymore. <laughs> I've been to that class. I right. my shot. <laughs> no, it's true. It's, it's lifelong. I mean, I apply that to myself. I realize that having been born into a society that is as racist as this one, I must have been impacted. And so I have to find out as I grow, as I mature, what that impact has done to me. And I have to ferret out the stuff that isn't good and erase all the stuff that I had known and replace it with something else. And that's what I advise other people to do as well. I see if we all do that, then it's a much better place. Question, will everybody do that? Answer, no. It's hard work. It's very hard work. I'll tell you a story about myself. Some years ago, I went to a retreat in Michigan, the university in Michigan. We were assigned roommates, at random roommates. So I had this white guy, we roomed together. Turns out he was a great tennis player. I love tennis. We played tennis. We liked the same kind of music. We hung out together. For three days, we were doing everything together. So at the end of that three days, we said, oh yeah, we're going to get together and so forth and so forth. We exchanged numbers and addresses. A few months later, I was living in Napa Valley at that time, and the kids are small. He calls me up and he says, hey, I'm going to be in your area. Can I stay with you? At that, light, at that point, I'm a different person. So I say, hmm, he's a stranger. I don't really know him. I have young girls. Can I trust him in my house? So I say, no. Nope. I'll give you the list of Motel 6's in the area. Now, later on, upon closer reflection, I realized it didn't have to do anything with my fear about, well, maybe a little bit, but more it had to do with the fact that he was a white guy and I didn't want to be the host for him. I had to confront that. And once I confronted that, that was the start of me beginning to erase that part of me, you see, but you have to know it first. Yeah, that's sort of an advanced step. Uh, to get there and really see, right. to really look at myself. I mean, even though I'm teaching it, I would tell students, I'm, I'm gonna, I will learn more than you will in this class. And that was often true, because there's always more to sort of look, look yeah. at when it comes down to looking within. So that willingness to do self-reflection, that's why I have this approach with, I had it when I was doing work with, in therapy with people. Self-awareness is the main step. If you have no self-awareness, you can't do much of anything. Because, you know, it's all about the seat of your pants at that point. But if you're really willing to, and it's hard work. It's been hard work for me, you know, to come face to face with the stuff. But then I realized I would not have done it this way <laughs> if I were in charge of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> but rather than see myself as a victim of circumstance, I simply say, okay, I'll find out what's in here and I'll get rid of the stuff that isn't working. I was at a um, seminar I do some work over at the Museum of Tolerance. A group of police officers were there. They were all white. I was the only black guy in the room. At some point, a guy raised his hand. He said, Dr. Roberts, I'm puzzled. He said, you seem perfectly at ease here in this room. If things were reversed, if I were in your place and all the participants here were black, 
I think I'd be very nervous. I said, talk to me some more about that. So he did. But I, I thought it was good for him to, to voice that. Then I was able to say to him, you see, I have done the work on myself over the years. I can be comfortable in any room with anybody because I know who I am. I even know who you are. <laughs> and I said, that's the difference, having that knowledge and awareness. And that means that I can make choices apart from attending to the fears I might have. You know, I confront the fears head on. You have yet to do that. So that became another peg that we could work on, hang things from in that room on that day. Because I think he also gave voice to what some of the others must have been feeling as well. Yeah, that was a, that was a good thing that he was, he was willing to say that. Right. And, uh, another thing too for you though, is that you've been thrust into those situations early on. Right. In order to get to go to grad school and do all those things, you, you've been in those situations, situations many times. Um, you have a book. I do. Lessons from Little Rock. And one of the things you talk about in, uh, in the book is that as a part of your work as a consultant, you went back to Little Rock High School. Uh, what was that experience like? Well, you know, Little Rock uh, Central High School is now a national well, park Central site. High school, yeah. Central High School is a, is a national park site. And I've been invited back to do programs and, and things. One summer I was the scholar in residence. Interestingly enough, I go back to Little Rock and people ask me, did you have any emotional reaction? I said no. No, because I understand that Little Rock is probably never going to be any different than it has always been. Folk there are so locked into what exists at the bone marrow level. I mean, there are changes, of course. You go down to City Hall, you'll find black people running City Hall. That doesn't mean that that much has changed in terms of how that society works. That simply means that's another example of the society bending and flexing to accommodate. And it's constantly looking for ways to restore the balance. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about other things that you're doing uh, as a consultant. I noticed that, I, think, I believe you were a consultant to the Rose Parade and... Uh, yes, you know, the, the Tournament of Roses came under heavy fire a few years ago because there were no people of color in the pipeline. They have the presidents, they know who's going to be president for the next 10 years. They're all in the pipeline. But you have to pay your dues. You have to be a volunteer. It's all a volunteer. And you work your way up through the ranks. Some uh, people of color found out about this and the fact that there were no avenues for them to get into the pipeline, so they began to complain. Tournament of Roses then sent out a proposal, a request for a proposal to help them figure out what to do. So I submitted one. I was one of about 17 or 18 people who did so. Then they had this round of interviews with us. That took a long time, several months. Eventually we were down to three, and I was a part of that group of three. And then we were down to me. And they called me in for one last session. And they said, you know what, uh, we think we want to go with you, but there's one thing. We don't want you to put anything in writing. So I thought to myself, hmm, the usual and ordinary way of doing consulting is you give a written report at the end. It's time consuming, it's a lot of work. I said, but you know what? I'll make the sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> I won't put anything in writing. I found out why they were so skittish. Prior to my being involved with them, they had engaged another consultant to do similar work years before. That report had wound up in the newspaper and it wasn't a very favorable report. They called me in after getting my assurance that I wouldn't write anything down. And they said, now what is the real problem here? We, we're trying to rack our brains. We know you've hired you, but we're not sure why. I said, well, get this. Here you are, a bunch of older white men. You wear white suits. You drive around town in these white cars. What is the image you are projecting here? <laughs> they, they didn't get it uh, even then. <laughs> but I did. I spent time working with them with the group of administrators in the Tournament of Roses. My expectations were that not much movement would take place based on who they were, and I was right. They simply do not have the awareness of what the needs are in terms of their own growth. They're perfectly comfortable with the status quo. They were going through the motions. I knew it, they knew it, but we did it.
You got paid. I got paid. <laughs> Did Although, I, I won't always do that. See, I'll turn down some jobs if I think is futile. Yeah. But then, of course, I have to eat, so. <laughs> <laughs> Any other consultancies that sort of stand out uh, for you? Well, yeah, I've had some unusual things. I got called in by the Episcopal Church at one point. There was one particular church, and the congregation was basically split down the middle. One in support of the minister, others not in support of the minister. Turns out, the minister had developed a keen interest in a woman other than his wife. And the congregation was upset about that. I thought, okay, this is an interesting job, but I'll take it. So I went to church as part of my research. I went to church and observed and participated and, you know, gathered all my data. And it was very interesting because I was able to find a group of people from both factions and I got them in the room together and they became the core group that eventually would change that whole situation for the better. So it all worked out. Yeah, getting people to talk yes. is, is really key. Uh, along the way, you've met several presidents. Uh, which, which presidents have you met with and what were those experiences like? Well. I think the uh, first one was Bill Clinton. I met him first when he was governor of Arkansas. I was very impressed with him, by the way, when he was governor. He seemed to be the kind of person who really was concerned about the welfare of the nation. So I was supportive of him once he ran for president. The problem was, uh, once he got derailed by Monica, I was no longer a supporter because I think I thought that he had abandoned his principles. It probably hadn't happened that way. He probably was, you know, just weak in that area anyway. Uh, I've since met uh, Barack Obama. Different kind of person. Uh, I think Obama, when he talks about having the welfare of the nation at heart, truly means it. And I think he was naive, however, in thinking that he could work with the Congress. They told him, but he didn't listen. <laughs> See, talk about a time to have your antenna out. That was the time. So uh, I turned down invitations from uh, George Bush to be involved in any activities at the White House. I didn't feel that I could, in good conscience, be there and accept him as the leader of, of the free world. <laughs> that was just a joke. Uh, in, re in reflecting back, thinking about your your early experiences, uh, how have they along with your master's in social work, your social work training, sort of influenced uh, your career and, and your current thinking? Well, you know, I tell people, well, not a lot, but some people I talk to, that when I went to SIU to work on my degree in psychology, I fully expected them to give me full credit for the work I had done in the master's program. I would have advanced standing in the program. They turned it down. They said, no, we don't recognize that as being valid at all. More than that, you will have to take the Miller analogies before we, and we have to see your score before we admit you to the program. Well, I thought all of that was a bit odd, especially the bit about the Miller analogies, because what they didn't know is that words are things I've been in love with since I was born. <laughs> I used to carry a dictionary around with me in middle school so the Miller analogies, no problem, I have 100 analogies. I scored 98 out of 100. And the people in the school were very impressed, you know. But point was that they were unwilling to accept what I had learned in social work. And I felt really chagrined about that because I honestly feel that the training I got in social work is the core training. All the other stuff has just been frou-frou on the side. In fact, I almost got kicked out of School of Psychology because I question a lot of their methodology. I question a lot of their assumptions because a lot of that stuff is culturally biased, test, you know, approaches. Plus, uh, like most professions in this country, they have a very racist past. You look back at psychology, you'll see it in terms of their pronouncements. But at any rate, uh, I've always felt that those two years I spent in the School of Social Work prepared me for this profession or prepared me to do the work I need to do in the world. I feel very strongly about that. Yeah, I read uh, Ron Dellum's book, uh, 
congressman from the Bay Area. And one of the things he said about being a social worker is he always thought he had an advantage because he was able to look with the third eye and hear with the third ear. In other words, really look beyond what somebody is saying to all the other things that we learn as social workers to look for in terms of the determining someone's meaning. Yeah, and I think for me, the essence of social work is really caring about the other. You really do care about what happens to people and how they live their lives. And I've tried to do that in, in my career, you know. In fact, when I was running my psychology practice, I would tell people up front, I said, look, I don't know enough to solve your problem. But if you're willing to work, I will work as hard as you will work, and together we may find solutions. Now, those who stayed, we did some good work. Others, oh, no, this guy's a cook. We're leaving here. <laughs> but I had to be honest with them. You know, but, but if I presented myself as being the expert, which I think is always a disaster, you know. I and I have colleagues who consider themselves expert in this field, that field, like, yeah, okay. But, see, I, again, with self-awareness, I remember being a young and eager psychologist. I came home one day and told my wife, I think I've seen it all. I know everything let's say it was a Monday. Tuesday, I had to come back yelling at her, erase, erase, erase. I know nothing <laughs> because uh, that Tuesday client had blown me away. There's, there's an advantage, advantage to staying humble. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And that may be the real key, you know, maintaining that balance so that you're never looking down on anybody or never looking up to anybody. Just maintain that peer level of balance. You know, that may be one of our essential problems. There are people who have the need to look down, and they yeah, feel yeah. that that's their right. Both and, within group and outside of group. <laughs> and there are other people who are so beaten down, they feel they have to always look up, which is, rare, is aggravating, because they have much more to give than that. So my job is to sort of help people maintain that equilibrium, you know, find a balance. Yeah, I think Jesse Jackson was right about the absence of hope. Mm -hmm. People don't have hope, and they, they, they're in despair. Then that creates a lot of problems. You know, uh, Brian Stevenson has a great story about that. He's a young man who heads up the Equal Justice Initiative yes, in yes. Montgomery. Brian tells a story of this man on death row when he first starts the initiative. He gets called in, but he reads the case and it is so far advanced and this man is so near being killed, he doesn't think he can do anything. But the man insists that he be involved. And Brian is reluctant, but he does. He spends time with the man, they go over the case, they plot strategy. Eventually the man has a date to be executed. And Brian talks to him at the end and he says, you know what? He says, I realize you probably think all of this was of no use. He says, but having you on my team and having that opportunity to meet with you and plan, that gave me hope. And Brian says, wow. And from that point on, he was even more energized to do the work. And it was, you know, what he's facing, a legal system that is so impaired and so tilted that you have all these black and brown people being killed systematically, not because there's justice, but because that's the way the system works. And he's, you know, he feels up against it all the time. Well, you certainly pushed uh, during your lifetime, uh, during your career, uh, both in your personal life and uh, professional life. And uh, based on what I know about you, you're still pushing and uh, speaking to people all over the place. Uh, I live in Huntington Beach, and you spoke there. Yeah, I was in your city. <laughs> yeah, I, I take Tai Chi, and one of the women in the class heard you, and she came in raving. Have you heard of Dr. Roberts? <laughs> <laughs> that was actually a, a good time. You know, they, your city chose my book as their one read for the year a couple of years ago. One of, the, one of the bonuses of doing that was they gave me copies of the books that had been previously selected. So I've got about seven books that I got to read from the authors who were there. Terry, it's been good interviewing you. Well, thank you and, for having uh, me. I think we've covered a lot. I know there's a lot that we haven't covered. But again, congratulations upon your induction into the California the Social Work uh, Hall of Distinction in California. and. Uh, but for further to our continued conversations. Very good. Thank you.